Okay, so this one is going to be a Fallout New Vegas lore. And this one is going to be the full story of Vault 11. Uh, the guy goes in really deep details of every single choices that you can do. He goes into details with the, the moral choices and why he does everything. He's a really good YouTuber. His name is Oxhorn. We're also going to le leave a uh, link to his YouTube in the description. The Brotherhood of Steel have sent us to Vault 11 to get a differential pressure controller to fix their faulty air filtration mm -hmm. system. Nestled in the mountains southwest of Trading Post 188, we find a shack door leading to the entrance to Vault 11. Inside, we have to kill a few mantises. But we see that the vault door is already open. Walking up to oh, the no. entrance, we find a number <gasps> of skeletons on the floor. Four to be exact, all huddled up in the same spot. Lying next to one is a 10 millimeter pistol. Let's see if we can find any information that can help explain this. On a table against he the wall. He goes so into details with the side quest. I love that. I love that. Every time I walk into a room like that, I would just walk around and be like, oh, where's the loot at? We find a terminal. And inside the terminal is the vault entrance security recording. Ejecting this holotape, we can load it up into our pip boy to hear what's on it. Are we really going to do this? It's open. We could just leave. I couldn't. Not after that. We don't deserve to leave. A shining example. That's what it called us. But we were. We did what we were supposed to. Not by a long shot. Anybody would have done what we did. You ask me? That's exactly the problem. Now let's get on with this. I'll go first. Wait, wait. People should know what happened. They could learn from it. If there's anyone out there at all. Oh. I hope they never have to find out. Ready, Harry? Yeah. No, no, no. Wait. Oh, God. What happened? It sounds like they committed su suicide or... Wait, did Voice 1 kill them? It's kind of hard to tell. It sounds like they were planning to commit suicide. Voice 1 argued against it because they were guilty about something. They did something that shames them. Voice 1 didn't want to... he killed them all. Says, Anyone would have done the same thing in our situation. And the other voices say, exactly, that's... That's the point. The shots sounded like they happened too quickly for each person to commit suicide. It almost sounds like voice one shot them. Is it because yeah. they're going to kill him first? Let's see if we can find out more. What stands out most to me is Yay, we find some side quest. propaganda posters on the wall that appear to be unique to this vault. We don't find if I would be a game developer and I would have this guy playing my game, I would be so happy because he really looks into every little details. That's planted by the, the developers. I love that. Them anywhere else in the wasteland. Rumors about Haley are baseless. Vote Stone for Overseer. Don't vote Glover. His family needs him. Haley is a known adulterer and communist sympathizer. Elect Haley for Overseer. I hate Nate. Glover has done nothing wrong. Vote for Stone. Rumors about Haley are baseless. Vote Stone for Overseer. Sounds like whatever happened at this vault to cause those four people to commit suicide happened right in the middle of a heated election cycle. An election cycle where the residents are electing the next Overseer of the vault. Going through the opening, we come to a room with three doors in it and a rat. After killing the rat, let's first go through the door that's and a rat. above it. Inside, we kill a mantis. How did those mantis get skeletons. in there? Some <gasps> of which are dismembered, lying on tables in the middle of the clinic. Some of the tables still have blood splatter nearby, and there's even blood splatter on the floor. We find yeah. bodies lying on the ground. I'm getting a picture that something catastrophic happened here. The wounded or dead were brought to the clinic where they were treated, but not before the end of the vault happened. That's why these bodies were never put in caskets or cremated or otherwise disposed of. There was enough time to try and tend to the sick like you would do in a normal society, but then that society collapsed suddenly. That's scary. We have the northern door. We can explore the bathrooms on this level. The one directly across from us is the men's. We don't find much in here, but we also don't find any skeletons lying on the toilet. Now, if you've ever Yay. explored any of these post-apocalyptic scenes, we often find bodies in the bathrooms. This is because when the nuclear bombs hit, the radiation or the blast was sudden and instant, killing people where they sat. But we don't see any of that here. None of these corpses... That'd be horrible to, to die on the bathroom in the toilet. 
it. In the women's restroom, kill a mantis, but none of these stalls have any corpses. This makes me think that whatever happened here wasn't a natural disaster or some sort of mass. Why is the toilet half the toilet missing? Animals. Not a whole lot of loot, but we do find a public terminal. And here is where we find three of the most prominent notes that are on every single terminal in this vault. The first is the Vault 11 election guide. This guide was written by Roy Gottlieb, the chairman of the coalition of the Vault 11 voting blocks and the mm, president mm. of the justice block. So the inhabitants of this vault have been split into different blocks or political parties, each of which has interesting, their own president interesting. and each of which come together to vote for a new overseer after a certain amount of time. Roy calls interesting, this interesting. voting guide the dweller's official guide. I also a thing that I that I really like about Fallout or a side note is that it's really interesting to see how like every vault has their own communities and ways of making their shit work it's really cool to see it's really thought through like many I like that guides it summarizes each of the overseers running for office their statements key positions and interestingly most importantly it says their endorsements the people who have endorsed their nomination. The first nominee for overseer is a man named Henry Glover. He has been endorsed by the Utilitarian Bloc, the Divine Will Bloc, and the Allied Service Workers Bloc. Let's read his profile penned by Henry Glover himself. He says, I'm a devoted husband and father of six beautiful children. My oldest, Sam, was on the honor roll this quarter, and I couldn't be prouder of him. My youngest, Henry Jr., just... I cannot trust a man that calls their own kids after their names. Said his first word, and it was Dada. We've got this bond already, and he's still just a baby. Friends, when you go to the polls this election, I want you to think of your own children. Then I want you to think of Sam and Henry Jr. Picture their faces. Nate Stone should be overseer, not me. The next candidate, Donna Haley, has been endorsed by the Human Dignity Block, and the United Vault Technicians Block. She says, I'm aware of the rumors circulating about me. I want everyone to know that there are vicious lies being spread by the other candidates in a desperate smear campaign. I have never in my life done anything so depraved. Consider the fact that I am grossly underqualified for the position and that both of my opponents are far more deserving. I know nothing about governance. You would be hard pressed to find a worse candidate than me. I can promise you my administration would be a disaster. Poor Haley, she was the one who was called an adulterer um. and a communist. And then we see the profile of Nathan Stone. What the He's hell? He's the guy referred to in the I Hate Nate posters. His sole endorsement is the justice block. He says, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't even be a candidate. And I wouldn't be a candidate if it weren't for all of the dirty backroom politics going on around here. It's sickening. You should all be ashamed. None of these candidates want to be overseer. Why are they running? The next note says, notice of postponement. This was written by Terry Hart, the president of the human Interesting. dignity block. He says that voting for the overseer has been postponed due to the tragic events of the past few days. We learned that there has been a spate of murders and that before they can do the vote for the overseer, the security team here in the vault needs to do an investigation to find and apprehend the perpetrator. He ends by saying, if we find the killer, we may have found a promising new candidate for overseer. We what? Tell me these people are not trying to elect the killer. Would you make a murderer overseer? That's what I'm saying. The last entry is Overseer Order 745. This comes from Catherine Stone. Overseer. Effective immediately, the traditional selection process for overseer is hereby ended. In lieu of a yearly election, a citizen will be chosen one month prior to the start of his or her term with our mainframe's random number generator, ensuring complete impartiality and fairness. Wow, all right, we just kind of learned a lot here. So nobody wants to be overseer. We don't know why yet. 
Because no one wants to be overseer, they use very dirty tricks to Maybe. get other people nominated. Maybe Sweating they're going to get like killed. You're an adulterer or you're a communist. And resorting to pathetic begging to get people to not vote for you. Oh, I have so many children. Do you really want to make them fatherless? It looks like everyone's goal with this election is to vote to for not the be of the worst. That's why Terry, to not be elected. <laughs> human dignity block thinks that once they find the murderer, that person will have a really good chance at becoming overseer not because the murderer is any great administrator or a good leader but because that murderer is the worst of the worst Being because they kill their overseers is a terminal but it's locked in a footlocker near the terminal we find roy gottlieb's terminal password remember roy was the president of the justice block one of the political parties here in the vault who is mm. in charge of distributing the voting guide after leaving mm. the password we open up the roy says terminal we find all of the same notes that we usually find but also a security recording Ejecting the holotape, we can use our pit boy to play it. Yeah. She can't do this. It's done. We're done. Nothing's done. She's got the authority. The only thing she can't do is change her own fate. Nothing says she can't change the selection process for future overseers. I say she can't. You shouldn't have toyed with her like that, Roy. We still I knew it was Roy. Oh. A hunger strike. Not exactly. Maybe march into her office with torches and pitchforks. Yes. Come on. I mean it. What? Start a revolution. Laws that's a uh... last their governments. Roy, all we have to do is wait until someone from Justice Block gets picked for overseer. Then we have them change the law back. There won't be any blocks after the new overseer is picked tomorrow. Everyone's going to move Oh, home. he's sad because he's losing his power. Go, who knows if we'll still be in the majority? We can hold the block together. You don't know that. Besides, what if the computer picks you? What if it picks me? And your solution is to start shooting? Not if we don't have to. Look, we arm up. We go to the lower floors, take some strategic targets. Power, food, water. Just until she turns authority over to us. The other blocks won't support it. They're tired of us having the power. We have the majority. We don't need them. This isn't a vote, Roy. They'll fight back. They've never had the nerve. Hell of a way to test it. So Roy was voice one. An unnamed associate in the justice block was voice two. They're talking about Kate Stone and how she has been overseer of the vault for the past year. I love how he actually explains it. To plan for the justice block. The justice block has been the largest political power here in Vault 11 for an extremely long time. They've had the majority and they have felt like they can throw their weight around to nominate whomever they want to become overseer so that none of their members ever have to. But when Kate went on a killing spree, murdering people in the vault, naturally all of the vault residents, even those in the justice block who weren't high ranking members, voted for Kate, feeling like she needed the punishment of becoming overseer. But Kate's first act as overseer was to remove the voting process. Damn, Kate took one for the team. Chosen at random by the computer. This effectively stripped the justice block of all of their power. All of this time, they have been able to use the threat of nominating someone else to become overseer as a means by which to get what they want in the vault. We also get another bit of information here. Voice 2 said, You shouldn't have toyed with her like that, Roy. How did Roy toy with Kate? Whatever he did to her may help explain why she went on a murderous rampage. Knowing that by doing so, if she was caught, she would be nominated overseer. After exploring all of the rooms here in the men's wing, we go around a corner to find a stairway leading back up to the lounge area. But the men's dorm connects to the ladies' dorm, so we can go back down to go down a hallway to explore the women's rooms here we can loot more vault suits from the dressers and lockers but we don't find any more terminals or holotapes on this floor so going back up we can go through the admin door this brings us dun, dun, dun. either turn left to go to security or right to go to the overseer's office Let's explore security first. There are two doors here. One is locked, one is not. The one that is not has a mantis inside, but after it is dealt with, we can loot a lot of containers. And it's here where we learn 
that the vault was well armed. We find a whole lot of ammunition. Half a dozen ammunition containers. Nice. And all of the boxes filled with hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Even grenades. Loot. 25 millimeter grenades just sitting out here. I guess this armory is in case the vault is invaded. It's also here where we find the security terminal. Inside we find the same notes shared by the other terminals, but one new one, deposition. This is Ooh. an excerpt from the deposition of the defendant Catherine Stone by vault attorney Gerard Miles. Gerard is questioning. Catherine is answering. He says, okay, let's pick up where we left off, Kate. She responds by correcting him. Catherine. Sorry, right, Catherine. I keep forgetting. Only my husband calls me Kate, she says. Gerard is questioning her. About I love this guy. He's so good. With Roy Gottlieb, the president of the Justice Block. He's the voice on the last holotape we heard who talked about a rebellion. Gerard refers to their conversation as an alleged conversation. She says, no, this conversation actually happened. He reminds her that it's his word against hers. And so he asks her to repeat the conversation. She sighs and says that Roy said that my husband's name came up in their meetings. Their meetings about who they wanted to endorse as overseer. They were planning to endorse, endorse by the way. husband Nate. Roy wouldn't say why, but Catherine knew that it was because her husband Nate had a regular poker game with some of them, and he'd been on a winning streak lately. They were trying really? to punish him for beating them at poker by nominating him to become overseer. That's fucked According up. According to Kate, Roy Gottlieb invited her into his office and said that he could prevent his block from endorsing Nate only if Kate performed sexual favors for him. <gasps> but not just for Roy, but for the entire block leadership what? and all of their friends. The vault attorney Gerard is What shocked, the fuck? Says, and you agreed? And she goes, well, what choice did I have? They had the majority. She says that this went on for about a month. This was essentially gang rape. She wasn't doing it willingly. She was being forced to do it to prevent her husband from becoming nominated overseer. And Dude, that's after fucked up. All of that, when the vault voting guideline no wonder she ended up becoming a murderer. Her horror that they had nominated her husband anyway. It was then that she decided to start killing off members of the block. She says, I "That's very valid." The majority is pretty slim. If I thin things out a little, especially the leadership, someone else might get elected. The attorney says, "Assuming you weren't caught," but she responds by saying, "No, no, I expected to be caught. That was my best chance. Now they'll all elect me." The attorney is confused. He goes, what? They're going to elect a confessed murderer? You think voters would risk putting it in your charge? She responds with surprising insight into the human condition. She says, they have to pick somebody and live with their reasons. You just wait and see. We learn that she was right. Again, at the very bottom, we find overseer number 745. Catherine Stone is overseer. So something horrible must happen when you become overseer. We learned that they have a new overseer election every single year. What happens to the old overseer? Why do they keep having to do this vote every year? For whatever reason, it scares the entire vault society. I wonder how many people are in the vault society. To avoid becoming overseer so much that she allowed herself to be raped by the leadership of the justice block repeatedly over an entire month. It was only after they betrayed her that she went on a killing spree. In the locked door right next to this security wing, we find another armory, lots of ammo boxes, ammunition, and weapons, which leaves the overseer office last Low key, to explore. Hold on. The plot from this one vault is literally better than most TV shows I've seen in the past few months. Are on this level. Heading down the hallway and going down the stairs, we can go through the door to the Vault 11 lower level. Opening the door, we can turn a corner to kill more rats and find two options. A hallway to the right and then the overseer's office through the door right next to us. Heading through the doorway, we trip a trip wire. It's connected to this rigged gun. I managed to avoid the blast somehow. And there's a whole lot to loot in this overseer's office, including plenty of pre-war money, scrap metal, and so on. There is one terminal here, but it says terminal locked. Please contact an administrator. It well, looks like we have to find a key. Looking through the overseer's window, we see an atrium out there. Let's see if we can find a way in. Heading out. The I feel like we're going to find out what happens the to the overseers. It's completely blocked up by soon. Some sort of cave in. 
So we go back and down that hallway that we initially passed to go to the overseer's office. Continuing along, we find two paths before us, both of which go to utility. Going down the hallway, we find a path to the atrium, but it's blocked up by a cave-in as well. So our only option is to go downstairs towards utility. Going down the nearest hallway, we can kill some rats to turn left and go to what appears to be some sort of storage room. In this room is a door to the reactor. Opening the door, we can kill some mantises, go down a long hallway to open yet another door. Here we find What's some ammunition happen? boxes in the corner, and we step right into a room partially flooded with irradiated water. But the most striking thing about this room are the sandbag barricades, and behind them, skeletons. In this part of the reactor room, there was a battle. That's why we find so much ammunition down here. Ammunition boxes and even rounds stacked up on nearby consoles. And the bodies, there are so many bodies. It sounds like what Roy said in his holotape actually happened. The justice block came down here to the reactor level and held it hostage. They took the ammunition from security and instigated a rebellion just because for the first time, potentially in the vault's history, everyone was fair game. Anyone could become the overseer. Since a computer was picking it, anyone from the justice block, even Roy himself, could become overseer. And to prevent Fuck Roy. that, they staged a rebellion. But like Voice 2 predicted in the holotape, this isn't about votes anymore. The majority no longer matters if the justice block stages a rebellion rebellion an armed rebellion everyone else will fight them and it looks like the justice block even though they had the majority didn't have the numbers to win these corpses we find here on the reactor level must have been the corpses of the justice block members now heading through a far door here we find womp, a womp. level completely flooded it helps if you have the rebreather that you get by completing the quest volare with the boomers this device allows you to breathe underwater however since it takes up the face slot it unequips my radiation suit so you may want to wear something like power armor that has radiation resistance swimming around down here we find more evidence of the armed rebellion. I mean, more after watching this, I'm not going to blame myself. You know what I mean? Lying over them. We find a storage room with a few ammo containers and other boxes to loot. And swimming west opens an armored reactor door. This leads us to a rather empty room. Turning south leads us through a doorway up some stairs out of the water. This leads us back to the partially flooded room with two options here as well. The right door opens up a stairway, which brings us back up to the utility level. However, I want to finish exploring the reactor level. We're going to turn back around and open the armored reactor door which brings us down a hall I love that he explores every rooms found in the previous room Unlocked loot brings us right back to where we were in that room where we first discovered the barricades so the underwater portion of this reactor level is just for those who don't have high enough lock picking to open up this door which connects back to the utility section so going back upstairs we now see that we have access to the cafeteria and the atrium let's go explore the atrium first Heading down the hallway, we can open a door to the right, which brings us to the ground level of the atrium. And here I found a whole lot of mantises. I had to resort I feel to like vats it's... here to pick off five or six different mantises. I feel like Let's it's not explore this lower um, level of the atrium. that it's many people had assemblies. Lots of in a vault. Posters on the wall. Here we see that graffitied I Hate Nate poster, which has been turned into I Hate Kate. Catherine judged the vault residents correctly. After they discovered she was a murderer, they all voted for her. Why is it so bad to be overseer? Continuing down the hallway, we go up some steps to the level above, which leads us to the top floor of this atrium level. Here we find an atrium terminal. And on the terminal is the prepared speech of... Of Gus Olson, the ombudsman for the annual overseer election. I don't this know how many people are in the vault. Officiating the election and chronicling it so that people can read about this election much later. At the beginning, he muses that the reason he's there, the reason he's chronicling this election, is to preserve these events for future humanity to read and learn from. But he's second guessing that assumption. He's starting to believe that the real reason these vault residents record all of the elections that go on here is because they're trying to find an answer to all of this. Perhaps after all of the elections are over, when their story, the story of Vault 11 is told, the answer will be revealed. Maybe that's why they're recording every election. He says, we want it to make sense, to understand why the Vault's mainframe will kill us if we do not offer one of our own as a yearly sacrifice to fully comprehend mm. why we continue to have these elections. Oh, yeah. Despite the unfettered corruption, I do remember that at some point, uh, I remember in one of the lore videos, we saw that like it said that it did take one person a year as a sacrifice, but then 
that some vaults decided to do it, some vaults decided to not do it, and they didn't actually need to do it, but they wanted to see if people would actually do it or not, right? That has plagued it for what must be decades by now. I feel like that was something like that. With the utility section fully explored, we can head back up the stairs through the, the overseer's office. The overseer's office. Yeah. If we have the passcode Betty. We can activate the terminal to open the sacrificial chamber. Overseer's desk lifts up, revealing a chamber beneath. As we get close to the door, we see a trail of blood <gasps> and human organs. Opening the door, we see a bright light. No way. Congratulations, martyr. Your fantastic journey is only just beginning. Please proceed. It doesn't the kill them, it puts them outside? The light is calming and puts your mind at ease. Go to the light. Light came from these big construction lights set up in this room. Heading through the opposite door. Welcome. Please sit in the chair. The show is about to begin. Maybe I don't want to sit in the chair. The show requires that you sit in the chair. Well, I'm not concerned. It's gonna the show them like the history, maybe, maybe of the really the vault or something. How about I just stand right here? Come on. Hmm. It is absolutely essential that you sit in the chair. Why is it absolutely essential that I sit in the chair? I don't want to sit in the chair. I want to stand sit in the goddamn chair, sir. No other choice. You <laughs> must sit in the chair. Well, if I have no other choice, then then that's it. Okay, I will I will comply and sit in the chair. Voltec presents Happy Trails. Greetings, martyr, and welcome. If you're here now, it means you've been offered up as a sacrifice so that your vault can continue to thrive. Currently, you may be feeling sad or angry. Perhaps you never got to have grandkids or to enjoy the pleasures of a fresh cigar. But march with your chin held high, soldier. And remember that each of us has an important role to play. For some people, their role might be to heal the sick. For others, it might mean they will drive a race car or fly a rocket ship. And some of us are meant to forfeit our lives for the good of the people. Sure, it might not be as fun as driving a race car, but it's every bit as important. Yo, where's the plot Let's twist? Take a moment to reflect on the moments that made your life worth living. Think about that time you kissed your steady girl for the first time. This is fucked up! <laughs> or when you snuck out after curfew to catch that new flick that your parents wouldn't let you see because it was too scary. Boy, were they right. And who could forget when you met the love of your life? What a looker. These are just examples. Do you feel that feeling stirring in your chest as you think of these things? Good. What you are feeling is peace. You've led a great life. Living it has been its own reward. But it is only the beginning. Close your eyes now. And imagine what joys await you in the next life. The afterlife. Can you see them? Good. Uh, my, what, what joys? I didn't see them. What? The doors open up on either side. Oh, no. <gasps> Robots attack. Uh, now, you'll forgive me. I still had my radiation suit on, so I'm going to use every single chem in my inventory. Yes, every single thing. Turbo, uh, 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 sim packs, psycho, mentats. I don't even know. Yes. I'm going to consume panic, it, and then I'm panic. Going to put back on my combat armor. Not and Make sure I have yes. the right weapon equipped. Make sure my status. I'm highly irradiated. Okay, I'm going to take as much rad X That's and rad very valid. as I possibly can. Get those rads down there. Oh, God. And now, to defend myself. I thought maybe you would, like, end up going outside instead. We get attacked. By robo brains and sentry bots armed with Gatling lasers and Tesla cannons. And the ceiling is lined with four ceiling mounted machine gun turrets. But that's just one side. The opposite end of the room has robots and machine gun turrets as well. ED is down. Veronica is down. But with the robots dead, I can hide behind this wall to take off the remaining ceiling mounted machine gun. Turrets. Nice. Oh, 
Oh, they're back. Okay. Good to see you, Eddie. Good to see you, Veronica. We survived. I don't know how, but we survived. But we're the only ones. Look at these corpses. Each of these was a Vault 11 overseer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight years. Did this vault exist only for eight years? But no. Going to the other side, we find more corpses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight on this side as well. Sixteen years. This vault existed only sixteen years after the bombs dropped, which means we're coming upon this scene almost 180 years after these events transpired. It must have all come Damn. to an end after Overseer Kate. Due to the armed rebellion, everyone died, meaning no more overseers, which is why we only find 18 bodies. In a sliding door on the opposite end of this wall we reach the vault mainframe this was the mainframe that as we learn from gus's speech notes was programmed to kill the entire vault unless it was given a yearly sacrifice mm. inside the terminal we can override the lockdown and eject two holotapes the system recording vault 11 solution and the automated response of vault 11 solution first we'll listen to the system recording all right i know this you can fucked hear me up. So listen up there's five of us left Five out of I don't know how many. So it's over. We'll never know how many. <laughs> and it's over. We're not gonna send anybody to die anymore. So shut off our water, our gases, or do whatever it is you're programmed to do. But we're done listening to you. Oh, these were the five whose bodies we found at the entrance to Vault 11. Well, four of the five. We remember that one of them dropped the gun and walked out. So after the Justice Block rebelled, causing Vault Resident to fight Vault Resident, the only survivors were these five. And instead of electing a new overseer, and instead of sending one more sacrifice, they decided to defy the Vault. They weren't going to sacrifice anyone anymore. The final holotape is the automated solution response, which is what those five survivors heard after they made their decision. Ooh. Congratulations, citizens of Vault 11. You have made the decision not to sacrifice one of your own. You can walk with your head held high knowing that your commitment to human life is a shining example to us all. And to make that feeling I knew it. sweeter, I have some exciting news. Despite what you were led to believe, the population of Vault 11 is not going to be exterminated for its disobedience. Instead, the mechanism to open the main vault door has now been enabled, and you can come and go at your leisure. But not so fast. Be sure to check with your overseer to find out if it's safe to leave. Here at Vault Tech, your safety is our number one priority. What a plot twist! It was all a diabolical experiment. In true Vault Tech fashion, Vault Tech was trying to see what would happen if Vault residents were told to do something completely inhumane by an authority when their lives were threatened. Vault Tech just wanted to see what would happen. They weren't really going to kill everyone in the vault, but nobody knew that. Not even the first overseer, or else he would have saved his own life by telling them the ruse. The final five vault residents learned this. When they decided not to nominate another overseer, they heard that automated message. Can and then decided to kill the themselves. Through their minds? After Dude, the whole the vault is dead because of that. The political parties, the corruption, the drug abuse, the scandals, the armed rebellion, their brothers, their family dead, with only five surviving. After all of that, to learn that it was all based on a lie. Had they just refused to nominate a sacrifice at the beginning, none of this would have ever happened. They would have all survived. This explains why the people we hear on the very first holotape are so guilt-ridden. The first voice, voice one, says, but we made the right decision, and he's right. At the very end, the five survivors did make the right decision. They refused to nominate an overseer. But the other four are still racked with guilt because for the past 18 years, they've been making the wrong decision. And everything they've experienced since then, all of the deaths, all of their dead family, is because they've been nominating a sacrifice every year. Yo, this would be such a good guilty. TV show. And that's why they all choose to commit suicide. Like, Loki, they could do such a good good tv show is just this whoever wrote that vault story they're deeply ashamed how could they have done this to people how could they have done this to their own neighbors and family they're ashamed right? of what they've done so they choose death they choose suicide rather than letting anyone know what happened here they think it's a fitting punishment 
all but one. Voice number one on the holotape refuses to commit suicide. He believes that it's better that the world learn what went on here, that people can learn from this, from all of their mistakes, from all of the unnecessary deaths. And then he kills everybody else. Here. People can learn something about human nature. Something this man about did not learn. Tick to prevent something like this from ever happening again. Maybe if these five people walk out into the wasteland, they can change humanity in a good way to keep this from ever happening again but he's overruled none of the other people want to deal with that kind of shame so they choose death leaving only voice one the sole survivor of vault 11 what likely happened is when he decided not to commit suicide the other four tried to restrain him to force him to die because they didn't want anyone to learn what went on here and so he pulled out his pistol the pistol he secured for himself during the armed rebellion and defended himself killing the last four survivors making him the only one left he sighs deeply he drops the gun and he walks out into the mojave wasteland no Applause, by the way. <laughs> what can we learn from this? What can we take away from this horrible story? Well, part of <gasps> this story is inspired by the Milgram experiment on obedience to authority figures. And we know this because, you know that part in the sacrificial chamber where the voice over the loudspeaker commands us to sit in the chair? Those lines are nearly directly from the Milgram experiment. That experiment wanted to see how far people would go when instructed to do something by an authority figure. It wanted to see what kinds of things a person would do if they what were told to so do That is so good. Authority. This was put together by a Yale psychologist named Stanley Milgram. And what he did is he connected a person to a device that gave very painful shocks. And then he connected a button to that device. And then he sat someone down at the button and told a person to push that button when the person pushed the button oh, yeah. the other person would get a shock stanley milgram i have seen see that how much pain a person was willing to inflict on another person just because they were told to and so each time the person pushed the button the shock would get worse stanley would sit there and say please continue the person is sitting there with the button i do remember button, seeing the that they've used that worse. experiment in a so lot of um requires that you continue a lot of tv shows as well absolutely essential that you continue you have no other choice you must continue the shocking thing about this experiment is they discovered that even for no other reason than that the experiment insisted that the researcher told them to they were willing to cause a great deal of electric shock pain to yeah. another human being just because an authority figure told and i've them seen i remember i've seen uh, an experiment like that where like the other person was like faking getting a shock they were like faking getting a shock every time uh, they told the guy like, oh yeah, like keep going. I think we watched that video on stream actually, but I can't remember. Yeah. And then they were just like going off and off and off and off and off. I'm just like pressing the button and whatever. Like people are, ugh. The same situation is mirrored here. Even though we don't want to sit down, we finally sit down in the chair because the authority on the loudspeaker tells us to. The vault dwellers would never sacrifice one of their own under normal circumstances, but because an authority tells them to. Reading this story when I was in fourth grade, I'm sure many of you remember this story too. In that story, a small town in America would have a yearly lottery where they would stone somebody to death as a way to keep the society united the thinking went if they could take all of the evils of the past year and project everything bad that went on onto one person what? and murder that person they can do away with the evils and if everybody's doing it the no one person is a murderer everyone shares that guilt and it brings the society closer together because they all share the knowledge that each of them is a murderer the men the women and even the children in the story a woman who protests this lottery this execution ends up getting stoned just so happens to be selected as the victim she gets put in the town square and one by one the entire town comes by and stones her even her husband and her children one of the reasons why this story is as powerful as it is and it kind of affects us emotionally is because it hits to something that we all understand and it's actually something that tommy lee jones relates rather eloquently in the 1997 film men in black when he says a person is smart but people are dumb panicky dangerous animals this is why companies <coughs> toilet paper last year 
get more evil as they get bigger. Why governments get more bureaucratic and lose their humanity and their common sense as they become more bloated. And it's because most people feel accountable for their own actions, but they're also lazy. And whenever they have an opportunity to give that accountability to someone else, they will. If a company is really small, then the only one accountable for the choices that company does is the president, the CEO, the people working in that company. It's so small, no one else is responsible for it. But when the company becomes huge, thousands of employees, when an employee makes a decision, even if that decision impacts a lot of people, he can always say, well, someone else in the company is responsible. I may have pulled the switch. I may have sent the tweet. I may have approved that product, but I only did so because X. It's a way of pushing aside responsibility. It's, lame. it's the same thing with large bureaucratic governments. Yes, of course, vets should receive amazing health care, but they don't, not because it's my fault, not because I did anything, but because of bureaucratic reason 895. In this story, everyone in the vault knew that murdering one of their own Man, this is a good side quest. Also, he takes this like so. like he takes it R. To so by an authority, partially because I am very grateful for the recommendation. Thank you. Everyone else was doing it. They didn't want to stand out, and it gave them an easy excuse for shuffling blame. Yes, I did vote to kill this one person, but so did everyone else. So I'm not really responsible. But the guilt is still there, which is why all of the election season propaganda was about trying to make sure that the person who's elected deserved it. Well, Haley deserves to be overseer because she's an adulteress and a communist. Oh, she did these evils, therefore she deserves to die. And it's why Kate ultimately got the nomination. Sure, they may all understand why she became a murderer, but at the end of the day, she's the only murderer who has been nominated, so it made their choice easier. It's easier for them to kill a murderer than any of the other nominees. All right, what if we really wanted to distill this down into something actionable? What can we learn from the story that we can take and use immediately in our gameplay. It, that's going to be different. In the gameplay. Person. But I'll tell you what it does for <laughs> me. This story made me question what kind of atrocity I'm willing to be a part of. And when playing Fallout, you side with factions. And when siding with factions, you have to come to terms with... Dude, this guy is literally changing this whole game into a whole curriculum. Like, I feel like I'm listening to, like, a class the atrocities that they commit as a member you're part of those atrocities and some man the direct agent of those atrocities depending upon the faction you side uh -oh. with and every single faction is going to commit atrocities whether it's the ncr attacking Can i just hear my own voice it's because they need technology or the brotherhood well, maybe was... energy weapon I don't know, I'm crazy. And strapping slave collars onto the necks of people just because if they're afraid of their own safety or the legion killing everyone and enslaving everyone because they value order or the institute kidnapping people and turning them into super mutants or replacing them with sense for the sake of research or maxon's brotherhood in fallout 4 stealing crops from settlers because the brotherhood needs it or going to acadia and wiping out an entire town of peaceful synths just because they're synths or even i want to play this game again the i want to play I want to play Fallout, but play the way this guy plays. I want to play any game the way this guy plays. Holy shit. Because they deserve it. What atrocities are we willing to be a part of? You know, when I publish my videos on Cook Cook and the Fiends, it's nearly universal. Almost everyone says that the Fiends are horrible. They're disgusting. They murder. They rape. They need to be destroyed. Almost everyone who leaves a comment on those videos says that they need to be wiped off the map. The fiends are evil, but you can't side with the fiends in Fallout New Vegas. In Fallout 4 Nuka World, you can side with the raiders. Those raiders are no better than the fiends. They take what they want, they murder whom they want, they do what they want. But when I published my videos criticizing the raiders in Nuka World from Fallout 4, I got a lot of people trying to justify their behavior. But they might not have if they weren't allowed to side with them. Which factions huh. are we defending just because we chose to side with them early in the game? What type of behavior are we allowing? Or are we turning a blind eye I love eye this guy. This is so good. Faction, the faction we like did it. 
Some will excuse what the Raiders and Nuka World do by saying things like, well, this is the post-apocalypse. We can't judge people by today's morals. You have to put your mind in the mind of a wastelander in a post-apocalyptic setting that has post-apocalyptic morals. And yet, how can we not judge Raiders for raping, pillaging, murdering, but then judge vault Tech for performing this kind of experiment? Or judge Cook Cook for kidnapping and raping? What happened in these vaults is in a post-apocalyptic setting. What happens in the Mojave wasteland with fiends is just as post-apocalyptic as what happens in Nuka World with the pack and the disciples and the operators. How can we say that we can't judge raiders or we can't judge Porter Gage because they're just living for themselves and doing what they need to to survive and they're just operating in their own post-apocalyptic morals. We can't put pre-apocalyptic morals on them but then turn right around and criticize vault Tech for evil, horrible, inhuman experiments Man, like this. Man, this guy's good. And of course, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. This is just a video game but I've always believed and one of the reasons I make these videos is because video games are a new type of art that tell really important stories just like books and movies do that's what I'm and saying it's important that we reflect on these kind of things not only just to grow yeah people, I like that but it's entertaining I personally enjoy thinking about these kinds of things even though they don't really matter they're fictional these events never occurred it is just a video game but I think we can learn a lot about the human condition by taking a look at stories like Vault 11. And if role-playing matters love that. to us, and if being either a good guy or a bad guy matters to us in our gameplay, then thinking about these things, really thinking about them, to understand what decision is the best one will help us better role-play. Anyway, that is the great tragedy of Vault 11, and it's one more reason to absolutely despise Vault Tech. I've shared with you my thoughts, but what are your thoughts? What were you thinking when you walked away from doing this quest in your game? Please let me know. Well, I didn't play the game, but below. I read all of your comments and I use your comments Dang. as inspiration for my future videos. I love that. I this was so good. This was so very good. I really, really like that. Um, great suggestion. Thank you so much. I love whenever you guys leave me suggestions of things to react to or watch i'm definitely gonna inspire myself of his uh gameplay when i do either a full playthrough of horizon zero dawn or witcher i'd rather do it for the witcher because i remember really liking the game and i don't remember the actual game yeah that was that was very interesting thank you very much for watching don't forget to like comment subscribe and if there's any suggestions that you'd like to leave in the comments